I'm Matthew Burchette, and this is a special You Asked For It, You Finally Got It episode of Behind the Wings with the F-14 Tomcat, baby. So during the Cold War, the U.S. Navy knew that they needed a fighter aircraft that could do a couple of things. One was protect the fleet from Soviet air-launched missiles, and those would be coming from Badger and Bear bombers. But they also needed something that could dogfight with those bombers' close air support. At the time, we didn't have anything that could do both of those roles. So what do you do? You open a project. In this case, the VFX project, called the Naval Fighter Experimental Project. What we got out of VFX was not this. It was actually the F-111B. It was huge, it was slow, and it couldn't land on a carrier. And Vice Admiral Thomas Connolly said, hold on, this is not at all what we need for the Navy. Guess what, Grumman steps in and says, have we got a deal for you? We've got a plane that we think will fit all those roles. It became known as Tom's Cat. And a little bit later, it became the F-14 Tomcat. It's one of the best looking fourth generation fighters ever, in my own humble opinion. But the day had to come, and in 2006, the F-14 was retired to be replaced by the F-18 and F-18 Super Hornet. Well, guess what? We don't have to say goodbye because we've got a real Tomcat pilot we're gonna talk to right now. So obviously this is an amazing aircraft. You know what else is amazing? The men and women that flew the F-14. And to that end, I have Lieutenant Rich Spud, we'll get to that later, Webb, who's with VF-211, the checkmates. So how did you get into flying? So for me, it was literally a childhood dream. I still remember the first time a July 4th parade when I was probably maybe eight and I saw an F-15 Eagle scream down Main Street with full afterburner. And I just remember screaming at the top of my lungs to my mom, like, did you see the afterburners? <laughs> and that was like my first, uh, that's the first memory I have where I identified something that just shook me to my core. And then subsequent air shows and experiences after that led me to taking flight lessons in college. And then when I got out of college, I decided, you know what, let's go for broke and applied to the Navy. And uh, turns out they accepted me and we flew F-14s, or I flew F-14s for about three years. And then our squadron actually decommissioned our F-14As. And then we transitioned to the brand new F-18 Super Hornets. So I kind of got, in my nine years in the, in the Navy, I got to fly a lot of different platforms. So Rich, it's probably been a while since you've been in an F-14 cockpit. September 2004, so yeah, coming up on 15 years. And uh, bet this I'm, one looks a little bit different. <laughs> I'm sad to see that this one has aged pretty poorly. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. You know, in 2006, the, uh, the Navy came out and they took everything out of here. And I can understand why. The platform was sunsetting and the only other country that flies this thing are the Iranians. Still a lethal. Yeah, lethal this is pretty weapon. much a skeleton in here. Yeah, it's, it's, it really it's kinda, is. It's kind of bittersweet. And of course, I haven't flown this, you know, this Tomcat in close to 15 years. But I was just kind of going through as I'm sitting in here, like procedures are starting to come back, and like for <laughs> out of control flight, uh, what we call OCF recovery. Let's see, it was upright 30 units, stick forward, neutral lateral, hunter's lock, rudder, opposite turning off, no recovery indicated, stick into turn, leave engine stalls, throttle affection, aisle of air source off, light off, no air signature, message, fire detest, on and on and on and on. It just keeps going, and and my brain is like pulling back those bold face EPs from That's 15 amazing. years ago. The real kind of heartbeat started to pick up as soon as the canopy came down and clicked forward about two inches to lock in, and everything sealed up. And then you just got this sense that you were strapped onto the most powerful rocket ride ever, <laughs> which it was. And then as you got more experience and as you got more qualifications, then you started to transition to where you strapped into it. You felt like you were putting it on like a jacket. I read a great 
um, little blurb in a book and the Rio always noticed that once they got back on the deck and the canopy popped, he would get out and he would stand on the back of the plane and he would wait for his pilot. Mm. And he would wait and he would wait and then finally the guy would get out. Mm. And after about four or five times of this, he asked him, why all, why are you waiting always- for, Waiting for his niece's stuff. Bingo, <laughs> yeah, that was exactly. it. Yeah, so you know, honestly, you know, a lot of people think that combat uh, is the is the high stress point of carrier aviation and it's absolutely not the high stress point is the last 30 seconds of final approach to landing on the carrier so you know if you back it up let's just start with the ship for instance it's rolling and it's heaving so it's, it's pitch roll heave it's just going all over the place so the deck is not staving through the water at say 30 knots so now your runway is moving away from you while it's pitching rolling and heaving and then on top Ooh. you're also landing at four o'clock in the morning so your circadian rhythm is at its lowest one. point keep in mind you've probably just done a six hour mission so you're fatigued and then there's no autopilot because the F-14 was designed in the 60s, built mm -hmm. in the 70s. You could fly a perfect pass and have your tail hook skip over the wires, oh. which happened. Oh, by the way, you're holding up everybody else as well. You know, that's the thing. No pressure. You know? You know, I've heard it described one time as like the culmination of like a high level executive making corporate level, you know, high move decisions with Olympic athlete, you know, athletic skills with ninja, samurai, warrior, <sighs> acumen, you know, kind of all combined yeah, into one. All and works. that sounds kind of um, bombastic maybe but it's incredibly accurate. So this guy probably looks pretty familiar to some of our viewers. It's an M61A1 Vulcan 20 millimeter rotary cannon, and it's the cannon that came out of this bad boy. And you shot this thing. Yeah, this was a beast. 100 rounds a second, that's pretty good. We carried 600 rounds. So if we're firing 100 rounds per second, that means we're out of bullets in six seconds. <laughs> so what we do is we we load up the drum. Every 50 rounds, we put a space. And then another 50 rounds, put a space. And then when we oh. went down for a full trigger squeeze, instead of having to kind of guess at what 50 rounds would be, like a half second burst, we'd just go trigger down, hold, it'd fire off 50 rounds and stop when it hit that that built-in space at 50 rounds. And then that way we knew we had 12 trigger squeezes at 50 oh, rounds each that's for, really a whole, cool. for a whole drum of, of rounds. You know, the rounds are coming out Right of, here. Yeah, they're coming out of the muzzle right here. However, the body of the gun actually comes all the way to back here. Like this is actually one of the panels where you would access the bullet drum. Well, if you look at where the seat is, it's directly over that. And you're literally sitting vertically on top of this gigantic, big old oh. hydraulically powered gun. So it's a pretty visceral experience when you're, when you're doing trigger squeezes on this. So the F-14 could carry an immense amount of payload from the, the Mark 80 series to the GBUs, um, the AIM-9, the AIM-7, but what it was really known for is the AIM-54, the Phoenix. Yeah, that was the, the hallmark weapon for the F-14 platform, and the AIM-54 was designed at the same time with the AUG-9 radar to be paired together as, as a weapons unit. And then the Tomcat was actually designed around the AIM-54 and the AUG-9 to actually fly and employ it. The Tomcat was capable, because the AUG-9 radar was so powerful and had amazing radar mode agility, it was capable of locking up six targets, fire six Phoenix simultaneously at all six targets, defend, shoot them all down, turn around, go back home for more. So at the time, that was unprecedented. And remember, this was designed in the Cold War era. And we were looking to beat back the Russian bombers coming over the horizon. And that was what the Tomcat system was designed for. Well, we continued employing that all the way into the mid 2000s. We kept upgrading and adding on more and more features. So we started adding on a lot more air to ground. We started turning into, you know, Tomcat turned into the Bombcat where we could drop dumb bombs, the Mark 80 series, the 82s mm -hmm. and the 84s, and then we retrofitted it with the Air Force lantern pod on the, on the wing pylon rail there, and we could then drop laser-guided weapons, the GB-12s and the 16s and all the way up to some other stuff. We even could carry a reconnaissance pod for doing self-contained reconnaissance with the tarp spot. We just kept adding more and more and more, but the Phoenix was the weapon system that the Tomcat was originally designed around, and that's the one that the Tomcat's known for. Yeah, what we're looking at here is the business end of the Pratt & Whitney TF-30 engine. So we had two of these, nine feet apart on centerline. And can you just imagine a cylinder of flame this big, you know, about three feet in diameter, going 30 feet out that way, two of them. What does that translate into top speed? Because it can't be slow. 
Yeah, so we, we translate that into factors of speed of sound called Mach. So Tomcat is rated for Mach 2.4, which is 2.4 times the speed of sound, which I think at altitude works out to over 1,500 miles an hour. So when you're sitting on the deck and you're, you're on the cat and you're ready to hit it yeah. and you're in what do you call it, stage five? Yep, zone five after. Zone burner. five afterburner. Yep. What does that do to you? I mean, it's because you're holding back that amount of thrust. Yeah, so you're holding back 50,000 pounds of afterburner thrust and the carrier's stopping you from going and all of a sudden the carrier, the, the catapult shuttle fires off. And so you go from zero to 100 knots, which is about 115 miles an hour in about 200 feet, <laughs> which is pretty impressive. And you're taking that all via a back slap, just one continuous 200 foot long back slap. Now here's the thing, when the deck is pitching and you're timing catapult shots, it's pretty cool because you've got the, the pitching period of 1,000 foot long carrier is pretty slow. So it's kind of about a, maybe a two second cadence. So they actually fire you, they release the shuttle on the, on the catapult when you're pointed down so that two seconds later you're going up. So you, it's absolutely physiologically the most messed up thing you've ever experienced. <laughs> it's just your, your, your gyros are tumble, tumbled inside your head you're absolutely just discombobulated. You're hanging onto the front end of a rocket and you're getting shot downhill, <laughs> downhill into a black right hole. Into the Hopefully that at the end of that two second ride, you're pointing up and you fly away. Wow. So you're, and that's the start of it. Rich, thank you so much. Absolutely, this has Matthew. been so much fun. Yeah, it's a pleasure to see you here. Thank you very much, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. And thank you guys and gals for watching because you are what makes Behind the Wings. If you've got questions or comments, Facebook, YouTube, we'll get to it when we can. And if you haven't gotten enough of the F-14, which how could you? Rich, tell us where we can learn more. Well, one of my favorite pieces that, that is currently out there that can be streamed from all the, the, the major suppliers is a film called Speed and Angels. And it's a documentary with unprecedented quality that follows two of my friends who I actually flew with, with all my instructors. Highly recommend it. I know what I'm doing later. Get off my plane, you kids. <laughs> that's, the, that's the curator metaphor. <laughs>